What that means for me is I have not had a drink or a drug since June 23rd, 2011. I'd like to welcome you all to the 2019 Oxford House World Convention. Please turn off all your cell phones during the breakout session. A uh, couple of things specifically about smoking uh, outside on the cobblestone walkway there. Um, if smoking, vaping, please use the alleyway behind the hotel. You, know, you cannot use the Starbucks, Starbucks to exit to get to the alley. Uh, do not smoke by the doors or the covered valet parking areas, and there's no vaping allowed in the hotel. Um, more specifically, there was a ton of butt, cigarette butts thrown on the ground out there. Please use the butt receptacles that are provided. Uh, they've been out there apparently all morning cleaning our mess up from last night. So let's respect the, the space that we're meeting in. Uh, so this panel is called the nuts and bolts of finding and starting a good Oxford house. How many of you have started or found an Oxford house that's now up in operation? That's awesome. So I'm going to read this first. So Oxford House needs to continually open new Oxford houses to meet demand for beds. Oxford House expansion happened in early years because members of existing Oxford houses found new houses to rent and some members of the older Oxford houses would move in to help get the new house running. They can, that can and still should happen. The early members of Oxford House were particularly adept at convincing new members to do most of the work themselves, the Tom Sawyer effect. It worked then and can still work today. Outreach workers can also be used as resource persons by individual Oxford houses and chapters that want to learn how to start new houses. This panel will review the basic elements involved in finding a new house, what's an appropriate house, and a neighborhood, and what should be done once a possible house is identified. The panelists are all experienced in helping to open new Oxford houses, and they will discuss what it takes to open new Oxford houses and identify practices that work and that don't work. So I'm going to introduce all of them because um, they're doing a couple of skits for you this morning on how to go about opening an Oxford house. Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! Yay! So first we have Emily Cato. Emily Woo Cato is the regional manager for Oxford House Inc. Stacy Hatfield, an outreach worker for the state of Washington. Woo Marty Walker, who is an outreach worker for the state of Tennessee. Jean McVeigh, an outreach worker for the state of California. And Stacy Levin, an outreach worker for the state of Maryland. So I'm just going to explain just a few minutes. Um, Jean, uh, just drop my card. Jean is, uh, is someone who's trying to rent an Oxford house, maybe an outreach worker, maybe a chapter officer, uh, somebody who wants to rent an Oxford house from. Marty and Stacy, who are landlords. So Jean's going to be the way to do this. Uh, and Emily is also trying to rent an Oxford house. And Emily is not what you want to do to try to rent an Oxford house <laughs> um, in this situation. So first, we're going to start with um, how not to open an Oxford house, how not to, to approach landlords, how not to talk to them in that whole process. Man, we've been standing here for freaking 45 minutes. She was supposed to be here. How much longer are we going to wait? It's raining. I got other people that need to look at this property. Where the hell are we going? I call shots like a ball. Stack nuts like a ball. Like a ball. Oh my god. It's okay. My name's Emily. My name's Mr. Uh, Bond. Hi, James it's so Bond. nice to meet you. Ah. And my name is Stacy. Yes, yeah, this is my Hi, wife. Hi, Stacy. Hi. Hi. I'm his wife. Okay. Oh. So, so we've been kind of waiting. Um, I guess 
Yeah. Uh, hi, Emily. It's hi. good to meet you. They finally show yeah. up. Oh. Yeah. Hold on uh, one second. Okay, Hold yeah. on. <laughs> hey, what's up? I don't know about yeah, no, nah, man, just give me like five minutes and I'm gonna be there, all right? Just hold on. Wow. Okay, sorry, it, it's someone. Oh, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, it's cool. Um, so, who's going to live here? Oh, a bunch of drug addicts. It's kind of like a rehab. You know? um, yeah, we all, we all used to do dope, but we don't do it anymore, so you're gonna be fine. It's gonna be okay. Damn it, hold on one more second, hold on. Dude, I have the money, I'll be there in a few minutes. Just give me five minutes. So how much rent do you plan on paying us? Well, I just figured, you know, like, uh, how, I don't know, what's it gonna take for me to get, my outreach worker told me that I can rent houses. So um, she sent me up here and she said, you know, just make sure I get it. So like, we could charge like, I don't know, maybe 200 a person and we can put like 10 or 15 people in here. So the more people we put in here, the more rent you're going to pay us? Yeah. Hey, do y'all got a light? <laughs> I know you listen. Hey. I just need a light, man. Yeah. <laughs> we have no smoking in our house. We don't want, we don't want anybody smoking in our house. Oh, uh, well. Would be okay? No, nah, probably not, man. I smoke out the window at night. <laughs> Do you have any more questions? <laughs> what happens if our property gets damaged? Don't worry, we're not gonna damage what your property. If our property gets damaged. Um, we're not gonna we're not gonna damage your property. What are you doing later? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you guys. <laughs> So that is not how you want to approach landlords to rent their properties. Um, yeah. So now we're going to learn how to do this. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll learn that. Now you will learn how, how to at least present yourself, the questions that you might be asked uh, when, when approaching a landlord. Uh, so Gene is going to show us how he's done it, how he's seen it done. Uh, and Marty and Stacy are, are again our landlords. Oh, you came oh, five minutes early. Really, right on. Oh, Hi, we just got here. Hi, Marty you? Walker. Hi, you. Nice Stacy Hatfield. Nice to meet you. Or Mark Walker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stacy Walker, my beautiful wife. Walker, He's my beautiful yeah. wife. He's our We're gonna Hatfield make Walker. money off this guy. Um, so, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Business card. Is this on? We have to go get up closer to this. You want mine? Hello. Oh, let's do that. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, okay. Uh, you've seen the property. Uh, who's going to live here? There's going to be a, a group of recovering individuals living here, which is kind of cool because you guys are going to have the opportunity to really do something really cool for your community. <clears throat> At the end of the day, you're going to be uh, providing 10 uh, alcoholics and drug addicts uh, a place to live, a safe place to live. How much rent are you going to be paying? Uh, fair market value. So whatever the fair market value in this area is what we typically would pay. So uh, you said 10 people. So is there the more people in the house, the more we can charge you? Yeah. Um, and I hear this one to two hundred dollars a week. So are we going to be? Getting I'm not sure where you heard that. <laughs> 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 so so typically uh, we're going to pay what you would charge a normal family. Uh, so if you had a family of ten people moving here, would you want to charge them extra for their kids? So we're you know fair market value. We're going to take care of your home. My goal is to pay your house off for you. So, you know, down the road, eventually we're going to pay your house off for you. We want to be a long-term resident. We're going to pay your house that off. Good. I'm that, that. I like that. Um, what happens if there's a problem? Who's responsible? What kind of a problem would you be talking about? If I don't get my money. You're going to get your money. <laughs> <laughs> We've never had an issue since I've been doing this that I have never had an issue of nobody getting rent. Would we call you if that You would happens? call me, okay. yes. And what happens if our property gets damaged? 
So depending on what kind of damage, if it's a hot water heater, I'm going to call you and you would, you would replace a hot water heater. If it's something that we damage, we're going to fix it. So we can't charge you double because you're addicts? <laughs> no. <laughs> what about if the neighbors? I threw thrown in a different question. What if the neighbors uh, don't like don't 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 want us to don't want us to rent to you recovering addicts? So I'm going to be completely honest. They might be a little bit upset at first, but they're going to love us after a month or two. We're the best neighbors on the block. Woo! Thank Woo! you. I'm interested. What kind of a lease are we looking at? Six months? Three so, months? So typically I do a two-year lease to pay the loan off, and then we could do a long-term lease after that. We do a loan to open the house. I'm liking this. I'm liking that, too. That sounds like a good Long deal. Long-term? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Helping people in recovery? Thank you. Yeah. Sir. No, thank you. So Gene just got us another Oxford house. <laughs> Next we'll hear from uh, Stacy Levin. She's going to do a PowerPoint. Um, so Stacy, if you'll come on up. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Stacy Levin. I'm in long-term recovery. My journey in recovery began January 30th, 2011, and an Oxford house saved my life. Um, so when I got, uh, when I got out of treatment, my plan was to jump off a freeway overpass because I, you know, I watched a lot of intervention and celebrity rehab when I was using <laughs> and I knew that nobody stayed in recovery. Um, and I was, I just couldn't do it another day. Like it just hurt to be alive. And I was walking to the freeway and this girl called me. And she said, my name is Jennifer, and I live at this Oxford house um, called Rolling Oaks. And this is in San Antonio. And she was like, um, we're all sitting in the living room waiting for you. We would like you to come over and interview. And I was like, mm, I'm good. <laughs> um, but I did. Um, they convinced me to come over. And, um, and all but the 21 days that I spent in treatment, I have been involved in Oxford house for my entire recovery. So. Um, <laughs> the reason that I am so passionate about opening houses is because when I, when the decision was life or death for me, there was a bed available. Um, and there were only two women's houses in San Antonio at the time in 2011 when I moved into an Oxford house. And there are a lot more of that of them now, but, um, if there hadn't been a bed available for me, I would just be another person that somebody was mourning every year on, you know, during recovery month. So, um, uh, for me, gratitude is an action word and, and that action, the best way for me to show that I'm grateful is to make sure that there's a bed for someone else who's coming behind me. Um, so this is, uh, how I do it. <laughs> um, all right. So finding a house, um, there are a lot of avenues to, find a property. Um, I have driven up and down streets and neighborhoods that I like. I uh, Usually what I do is I, I go to Zillow.com or Realtor.com or Craigslist. Um, I find a house that I like and then I go and look at it and then I drive the whole neighborhood and look at what else is for rent. <laughs> And I'll just write down phone numbers and addresses and I will make phone calls. Um, so um, <clears throat> when I schedule the meeting, I dress for success. Um, I, you know, I want to um, be as approachable as possible, but as professional as possible, because this is like, you know, I'm not, I mean, I, I tell people on the phone, I'm renting it for a family that I'm looking to rent it for a family. Like when they ask me, who's it for you or a group or whatever, I always tell them it's a family. It's a, it's a non-traditional family, but it's still a family. Um, so I want to, you know, be able to be as, um, I want them to be comfortable with me. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and I try to, um, I try to really like 
rent houses directly from landlords and not property managers. Um, I have had some, sex, some success with property managers, <laughs> but... <laughs> But it's a lot harder. It's a, <laughs> it's a lot harder to convince a property manager. It's it's a lot harder to convince a property manager who's really only looking at like the bottom line, money wise. Um, their job is to make as much money for their client as possible with as little repair. So, um, and then when I'm on the phone, I give them as little information as possible. Um, I, I never tell them that I'm looking to rent it for an Oxford house. I, you know, I tell them that it's for a family. They ask me how many people. I usually say six because, you know, six or seven um, tends to make them comfortable because that's, you know, there are lots of families, traditional families that are six or seven people. So I go to look at the house. This is a packet of information that I've put together. Most of this information is actually probably in your, um, in the, folders that they put in your bags, like the fast facts about Oxford House. The for landlords is right off the website. I just copied it, pasted it into a Word document. And, um, and then the saving money, saving lives, that's also in your packets. So you can make lots of copies of that information. It's also on the website, the oxfordhouse.org website. Um, <clears throat> but I compiled it and then I got a couple of landlords to write letters of reference and then I put it in a folder on my, this is my computer. So. I look at the house. Um, I ask myself, like, would I live here? Because if I wouldn't live here, I'm not going to try to get the house. Um, is it affordable? So the way that I do this on the fly is I basically take the rent that they're asking for, um, add $1,300 to it, divide it by the number of people that are going to live in there, and that's basically about what EES is going to be. Um, so if it's, um, you know, if it's like, $2,900 plus 12 to 1,300 um, divided by eight, it's about 150 a week. Um, then, you know, that'll work for, or divided by, I'm sorry, divided by eight divided by four. So it's the rent or the lease payment plus 12 to $1,300 um, divided by the number of beds divided by four, because, you know, I mean, even though there's not really four weeks in a month, it just works out that way. And then that's what each individual is gonna pay per week. So I wanna make it sure that it's affordable. Um, when I came into recovery, I had a job at a bakery. I was a baker for $7.25 an hour. And, um, and I was you know, working 40 hours a week. And so I want the house to, I want the EES to be affordable enough so that somebody who makes minimum wage isn't gonna struggle to live there. Um, and then I look at if the house is gonna meet the need, where it is, is it close to meetings, um, grocery stores, um, employment opportunities, you know, if it's, I mean, I have worked in some rural areas where there isn't public transportation, um, and so public transportation isn't necessarily a factor, but if there is public transportation and it's a means for people to get where they're going, because you know, some places, like there's a bus that runs every hour, between like seven and five and then, you know, like not at all on the weekend. So if it's not a big factor, I don't really worry about it. But if it's a, if it's a factor for people gaining employment and being able to get where they're going, then I want it to be within um, a, less than a mile from a bus stop. Um, so I, you know, make sure that all of those things, that it meets all those checks on my box. Um, and then this is my pitch, I say, my name is Stacy Levin. I work for Oxford House, establishing peer-supported democratically re democratic res recovery residences. Our evidence-based model teaches responsibility and accountability while providing structure and support to members of our recovering community. Your house would be an ideal addition to our network, and I want to work with you to make our community a better place. And um, they either say no or <laughs> they say yes. If uh, if I if someone is really uncomfortable and obviously not into it. I'm not gonna keep hounding them. You know, like I keep it short and sweet. Thank you so much for your time. If you wanna take this information and share it with your spouse or um, business partners or whoever and get back to me, my card is in there and you know, I'd love to talk to you more about it. Um, if they ask me engaging questions and you know, I'm pretty sure they're interested in, in my opinion, um, we are the best people to rent houses from. 
We, uh, we sign long-term leases. You know, we um, take really good care of the property. We mow our lawns and we are respectful to the neighbors and, um, and it has been my experience that people that were not sure about renting to Oxford House, renting their house as an Oxford House, ended up renting a second later on. So I just share my experience, you know, but I'm honest. I never, um, I sell the highlights, I answer their questions, I explain the system operations, I leave material, and, and at the end of the day, like, I ask for the lease. Like, I don't leave that first meeting without, if they're interested, without saying, I can send you a lease by the end of the day, and, um, and you can look it over, and then we can get it signed and move forward with the process. I never make a promise I can't keep. I never promise that they are going to get full rent on the first of the month, every single month. I never promise that there is never going to be a problem with the house. I mean, if they were renting to a family for 20 years, there would be problems with the house. There's wear and tear. You know, I do tell them that with eight to 10 adults, there's probably less wear and tear than there are with four children because we're not going to be taking Sharpies to the wall or, you know, um, tearing up carpet. Although I prefer not to rent houses with carpet. That's just me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like, Yes, there are going to be 10 adults taking showers every day. However, most of those members are gone during the day or they're gone, you know, like they're not all home all the time. Um, so they're in and out living their lives. And, um, <clears throat> and there's just going to be less wear and tear. And that's been my experience. Um, don't be afraid. Like what you're selling is gold. You know, like you are selling somebody the opportunity to pay off their mortgage and put their grandkids through college. And that's what I tell people. Um, and don't take it personally if they say no. Uh, I have about a one in three ratio. For every three houses I look at that I want, I get a lease on one. I've been told that like early on, it was definitely a lot different. It was like maybe one in 10, maybe one in 20. Um, <clears throat> everything I learned about successfully pitching a landlord, I learned from Marty Walker uh, when I called him when I was really like, I think I'd been working for Oxford House for like a month or so. And I called him and I was like, every house I've tried to look at, they've told me no and hung up the phone. And he like told me how he did it. And I have done that every single time I've looked at a house since. Um, a lot of, I mean, the trend is now to find investors that really get behind the Oxford House model and they get it and get them to you know, buy a house and then buy a few more houses and then get their friends to buy some houses. And I do have some investors and I've developed some investors in some states that I've worked in, but I also go and rent houses. I go look at houses that I find online or that I see while I'm driving down the street and I pitch those landlords and, um, and I've, you know, I've had a lot of success with that. So here's the fun part. They said, yes, what's next? The first thing you want to do is make sure that, um, we'll pick a name and make sure it's available. Um, and then get out, get your lease paperwork and your EIN, which, um, you can get at this website, the sa.ww, whatever, but also you can Google get an EIN <laughs> and it will pull up this website. Um, and you want to go to the IRS website. It's free. Um, so if you're looking at a website that says it's like $10 to get your EIN, you're on the wrong website. Um, so you put in your information, the house's information and address, uh, the start date. I always started a month before it actually opened. So that way, once I get the EIN, I can go to the bank and open the bank account and turn on all the utilities. Um, the utilities and everything should be in the house's name. If you call to set up utilities somewhere and they say they can't do that, ask for their supervisor because there is a way. They're just not really understanding what you're doing. And it can be frustrating, but, um, but it will happen. Um, and then the fun part, making a house a home. So if you have a Habitat for Humanity Restore um, in your area or Goodwill that has furniture, Salvation Army, the one thing that I always buy brand new for a house and I spend the most money on is beds. I never buy used beds. I buy beds from factory wrapped in plastic so that I know that they're, we're not going to start the house with a bed bug problem. Um, I, um, 
I will get as much furniture as I can donated. There are apps like Let Go and Next Door and Craigslist has a whole free section. Um, the Facebook Marketplace, um, you know, and I'll put something on social media saying I'm opening this recovery house. We are a 501c3. All of your donations are tax deductible. We give them receipts. They send all that information to whoever they send it to to do their taxes. So um, it's beneficial for people to, to um, to donate furniture or other household items. I approach the other houses in the chapter and ask them for a um, set of dishes or uh, to sponsor a bed or to you know put $100 into the first Walmart run. Um, depending on the number of beds in a house, I found a company that I get beds for $125 for twins, $150 for folds, and that's mattress box, spring and frame. Um, and then my Walmart run, my initial Walmart run, is between six and eight hundred dollars, and and I and I will get shower curtains and dishes and pots and pans and paper towels, toilet paper, cleaning supplies, mop, uh, broom, you know, trash cans, everything, binders and all the stuff that you know we need to make the house successful. And then I basically just let everybody know in my area, like, hey, we're opening a house Sunday the fifteenth. There will be food. You'll get fed spiritually and physically. So come use your muscles and move this furniture in and make it a party, make it fun. And, um, and then, you know, I get all the books ready and I take them over for their first house meeting and, we, and I kind of just lay everything out on the table and go through and do all the reports and show them like, this is how your house is starting. This is how much money you have. This is where all the startup loan money went. And then, um, and I involve the housing services committee in all their meetings and, you know, get them all pumped for like this, this new way of life. Um, I'm very grateful that an Oxford house was available to me when I was early in recovery. I, this is my first experience in recovery. Everything I learned about being in recovery, I learned from my roommates and my chapter in San Antonio, the people who showed me where meetings were and, you know, talked to me about finding a sponsor and, working steps and all that stuff. So like, um, it's really important to me that this is available to somebody who doesn't even know whether or not they want to get clean yet. Um, but when they do, there's going to be a bed for them if I have anything to say about it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention earlier, if you're using the convention app, remember to rate your session that you're attending. Um, we've got about 30 minutes before this panel's over, so um, I'm going to ask one of the panelists to come up and just share a little bit more in depth about what they see and what they do. Uh, but I'm going to say just a couple of things that I know that I have done and I have seen. Um, Stacy said when you're we're approaching a landlord she doesn't let them know who she is over the phone or that she's going to rent the house for an Oxford house uh, because you want to sell yourself you want to sell Oxford house you don't want them to hear recovering addicts and know that's not a not an opportunity for you um, we're kind of at an advantage in this day and time in the sense of opening houses uh, just simply because addiction has touched everyone's lives um, I, I rarely run into someone who their brother or mother or sister, whoever, hasn't been touched in some way uh, around addiction. So uh, we're at an advantage there if folks are in the market to rent their properties, uh, and then we have that in common with them already. So um, if you've ever seen the 60-minute video on Oxford House, you see Mark Spence talking about he tells his story. He lets them know, you know, because... An Oxford house was there that gave him the opportunity to do what he is doing. Um, now, I'm not saying you go and say, you know, I shot dope for 15 years, I smoked crack for 10, you know. Um, <laughs> that's not what we're talking about, you know. Um, be confident. Be confident in what you're doing. You know Oxford House. They don't. You, can, you don't have to twist their arm on this thing. Um, like Stacy said, I mean, it sells itself. We've been around for 40 some years. So that right there to me is like, wow, this, and they've got all this information and all this data to back it. So um, use the resources that you have available to you. Uh, and 
most importantly, do not be afraid to walk away because we cannot afford to get into houses that we really don't want to be in. And, you know, that's not setting up houses for success. Um, I always ask myself the question, would I live in this house? Would I be comfortable living here? And if I don't feel comfortable living there, I'm not going to ask to rent it. Um, and that's just the truth. Um, knowing your audience, you know, like your property managers, that's always a little more challenging because you want to get personal with that landlord, that investor, uh, and be able to talk to them, not let a property manager try to sell Oxford House on your behalf because they don't know. They don't have your experience. They don't have uh, the knowledge that you do about Oxford House. Um, so I just wanted to mention those few things that, um, that I know that I always try to do when trying to find an Oxford house. And I will say I've walked away from more houses than I've probably got. Uh, and that's just because they're not the right house for us. And that is okay. Uh, there are so many houses out there. Uh, and, and, you know, we want this house. We want a house. We want a house. But we want the right house. And that's what we got to keep focused on. We got to get the right house. You know, we want the best house on the block. Um, so just keep that in mind and just don't be afraid to, uh, to just go out there and do it. You know, I remember going for, um, the first house that I went and looked at, it was like, yeah, this is going to be the one. And it definitely wasn't, you know, so I had a lot of learning to do, but you know, as you go, you, you start getting more confident and you get your first house and guess what? They're going to start rolling. So, um, get involved with that. If you want to start an Oxford house, Go back to wherever you live and let's start some Oxford houses. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so there's just a couple things. Uh, one, uh, I, one of the things that I've done over the years, especially if it's in, if it's in an area, if your chapter has decided we're going to maybe go into the next town over or into an unestablished area, there's a couple of things that I typically do. I typically pull up that area on online. And I look at stuff like uh, unemployment rates. I look at how many people are there. Uh, so I have a pretty good idea of what's going on with the demographic there. And then I go to that area and I start going to meetings and I start kind of checking out the recovery community to, to make sure that they can support a house. You know, uh, I know that, that we're in the business of, of uh, replicating and opening houses, but I don't want to open up a house just for the sake of opening a house. I want to make sure we can fill a house and I want to make sure the house is going to be successful. So part of that is doing the, doing the research before I get there. So I look up stuff like that. I start hitting meetings. I start doing that kind of stuff. One of the other things that I do is, uh, cause I tend to deal with investors more than, than just landlords. So if I'm looking at a house and I know that the property, the price of the house is well, when I was in Oregon, say $250,000. So then I research it. You can go online. You can look up what the house payment's going to be for that type of house. And I look up property or the property taxes, and I look up insurance. So I have a pretty good idea of what that landlord's going to have to pay a month. And then when I start negotiating with them, then I kind of know what his bottom line is. And if they're trying to really inflate the price, and I've even said it, well, I know you probably got about this much going out. And when I've done that, they get this look on their face like, how do you know? But, but I think it's, 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 it's our responsibility to know that stuff so we know that we're not going to get, you know, we're going to get the best possible deal we can get. So you can look that stuff up online. You can look at, you know, you can look up the property. If you go to Zillow, it'll tell you what the property taxes are on a house. You know, so you can look at that stuff uh, so that I have a real good idea going in about what we're going to do. Uh, so that stuff for me is really, really important. You know, then I know that I'm not really kind of getting taken on a deal. Um, and unfortunately, with some of the investors now, they want 1%. There's no getting around the... Uh, uh, so it's made it a little bit easier to, to figure that stuff out. But, but you know you're going to be able to find investors that are really just wanting to do it because they want to do something good for their community. And I've had investors that aren't even looking at getting a 1% return. So that kind of stuff is really nice when you can find those investors that are motivated to just be able to give back to their community and to be able to build equity in a house 
and to be able to pay the bills that they need to pay and, and be able to put a little bit aside. So you're going to have two different investors. Some of them are just motivated that they want to make a bunch of money as much as they can. And you're going to have the other investors that are saying, okay, we want to be able to give back to our community. We want to be able to pay the bills for this house and be able to put aside a slush fund so that if something happens, we can fix it. Uh, so you'll, you'll run into a couple different types of investors. I like the... I like the ones that want to be able to give back to the community, but unfortunately this day and age, we're looking at uh, the ones that are motivated to be able to make money. Um, so, uh, like Stacy said, be careful when you go on the, online to set up the EIN numbers, because it'll try to take you to sites that are gonna wanna charge you. Uh, if you get to that site, back out of it, go to the IRS site. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I don't know that I have any more. The, the most important stuff for me is investor stuff and really looking at areas. You know, go go to meetings and make sure that uh, that that area can support an Oxford house. Make sure that they have a good recovery community. Go, you know, the areas that I'm in, uh, the, the 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 meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, damn sure know who I am before I get done. Uh, so it's important to me. Uh, anyway, that's all I got. So as we were sitting up here and realizing we had some more time, we all thought we'd come up and just talk about a couple more things. And so uh, the irony is that we've all been doing this and we all know what, you know, the things we want to say. And Jean just said exactly what I was going to talk about. So I'm like, huh. So, uh, so I come, come up with something else. Um, one of the things about the recovery community, that, that, that is definitely a plus. So um, uh, lately, in the last couple of years, I have thought outside the box and opened up some rural areas. So we have some areas like 5,000 people, and that's, you know, pretty like, huh, is this going to work kind of thing. And, you know, um, so we have lots of, we, I'm from Washington State, where we have lots of houses. <laughs> And so it gets to a point where, you know, our, all of our metropolitan areas are, you know, we, we have lots of houses. We can open them up every, I mean, we could continue opening them up. But then you get all these areas that are 50 miles north or 30 miles south or, you know, that we, they really want what we have, you know. And, and, and one of the areas um, I actually grew up in, uh, 40 miles north of Spokane, Washington. And uh, so I had a heart. I had a heart for that area, you know. I mean, I want these people to have what I have. Had. And so I, you know, I go up there and, and have a lot more heart into this than, you know, looking at, at what you need to look at, you know, the economy. Um, what, what are they going to be able to sustain this house? Um, the recovery community is huge, like he said. So I have a couple of areas with, that I have done and, and, and honestly, some of them may fail but I tried, you know, and I, I, I saved a couple of lives. We saved a couple of lives in the meantime. Um, but uh, that recovery community, I, it was, and this was actually quite a few years back to where I realized that's my first step and that he had said that. that. That is now my first step, because the recovery community, it had a great economy. It had, um, and it was kind of, you know, on the larger side, it wasn't a 5,000 person town. And, but the recovery community just could not support this, this house in a, in a town of 20,000 people. There just was no recovery community in Moses Lake, Washington, <laughs> the one we never want to talk about. Um, <laughs> Uh, but then I go, then I've gone into some of these other areas. And so I got the, uh, just a year and a half ago, I opened up the, we opened up the first house in Idaho Woo! and we get over there and I'm, and, and if I've kind of felt at first, like this is, you know, um, you know, I'm not going to lie. It's like that courtesy, like that check, you know, we got one in Idaho, you know, that's, and I, I, I get there and I'm there that first month and I'm doing, you know, getting the house set up and getting to know the, re and getting to know the recovery community. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is flipping awesome. We're going to have three houses here in three months, three months from now, we are going to have three houses. The recovery community was amazing in Lewiston, Idaho, and we have three houses we had three houses in three months we're looking at opening up another house um but that was something that you know that 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 that, that all plays into factor so here's this other area that i love and have a heart for and i grew up in and it's just not gonna you know three and a half years later it's just not gonna work we're actually gonna be closing that house down but it's it, it, we did get a lot out of it you know a good run but that's that's the difference um 
And then once again, we're opening up a house. We just opened a house in OMAC. OMAC has amazing recovery with 5,000 people. So we just opened up last month. We don't, aren't, you know, we'll see how this is going to go. They want us to open up a woman's house as well. I'm like, wait, let's just see how this one's going to go here for three months. Let's give it three months. Um, so opening up the new areas, definitely that's something that we want to look at. Um, and then another thing I just want to talk about real quick is the women's and children's and men's and children's houses. So those houses, um, uh, the, you need to look at them differently. You know, they need to be, they need to have a safety factor. Um, you know, we don't want steep, narrow stairs. Uh, I really like it when we don't have any stairs at all, but you know, like what kind of house is that? No, we're not going to fit 10 people in a house that's usually not like that, you know? Um, so I have some split level homes that are awesome and, um, they, they, I have a 10 room house, 10 bedrooms, you know, not 10 man, it's 10 bedrooms. Um, they've built an addition on the back of it with two kitchens, a kitchen up and a kitchen down. So those, um, you know, quite a few bathrooms, a fenced in backyard, all of those things are key to having the Wish Children's houses. Um, you know, I, we like them to have like a, a separate, a, a, two living rooms kind of thing, you know, so that, you know, not everybody in the house is going to have their kid. So, you know, that there's some women and ladies in the house that are, you know, able to lounge around in this living space and, and this living space is taken over by toys and kiddos and SpongeBob, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it, that we have those separate spaces. Um, you know, so it, it, that safety factor is something when we're looking at houses, it's not all about the rooms always. You know, I look at a house like we need a women's and children's house right now, and we're looking for a house, and we found one, but it's not going to be a women's and children's house. We're just going to open up another woman's house. So the next one, you know, we need a with children's house, but you got to watch that and, let, and think of the, the safety factor for those kiddos. Thanks. Thanks. Hey. hey! Keep it moving. Keep it moving. Um, okay, so real quick. How many people, I saw, we saw the people that have already opened houses. How many people are willing to open a house? That's what's up. Uh, give them a, wow. That's the whole freaking room. That's the whole room. Um, so one of the things, you know, and it could be kind of intimidating to deal with a brand new landlord, like a potential landlord. One of the things I, I, I in this day and age of robocalls and telemarketers, the last thing a person wants to do is get another phone call from somebody w wanting something. So I don't use the phone. When I'm going into a new area, brand, if it's a brand new area where they don't know nothing about us, we have no credibility, I get in the car and I go to the office. Um, Stacy pulled up all of Zillow right there. One thing that I avoid like the plague is it'll say click here to schedule an interview no absolutely not S keep scrolling down it's going to have the office it's going to have the location and it's going to have the listing agent write that down make a little packet form get in the car and go to their office don't click nowhere for any type of automation uh, you might get an automated response. Um, just, just I cut right to the chase and go right to the person with my little, you know, I show up on time, I give a business card, uh, and I have my uh, list of references. That has been the most critical piece of this whole thing for me to be able to find houses. That's what I, it's not really a miracle thing for people, but when they say, man, I'm struggling finding a house. I find out, well, how, what's your system? How are you doing it? Usually, they're working the phones and they're clicking on the button to schedule an interview. That's usually the problem. If you get in the car and you start meeting, uh, I remember I was in Louisville. I was in, Lu and that's how you pronounce it, Louisville. It took me six months to figure that out. <laughs> Emily <laughs> finds a house before I do. Yes. <laughs> I'm very proud of 
So she's always going to have that on me. <laughs> always. It's, uh, and she had just gotten hired. She had yeah. just got, it's snowing. It's, it's miserable. I'm going to tell you, it is miserable in Louisville. And this girl nails a house like Woo! two days later. Yeah. So I'm like, I got to go get a house. <laughs> I gotta go get it because she can't. I can't give her that much of a lead, man. She got a head start. Ten more days. No, it was the next day. Was it the next day? Yes. <laughs> yes. I got in the car, and I pulled up. Here's what I did: is I I got to the hotel room, and I'm like, okay, it's time. It's freaking show time. Pulled up. I'm I'm gonna pull up every property manager in Louisville. And I'm going to start with the A's. And then tomorrow I'm going to start with the B's. And tomorrow I'm going to start with the D. And, you know, we're just going to go alphabetical. And there's a lot of property managers in Louisville. And I started with the A's. And I wrote down 10. And if I'm not done there, I'm going to keep going. The very first property, I show up at the, I don't make a phone call. I don't click on here for an appointment. I, go, I show up at the office. It's about, a, and, and he's not in, but he will be back shortly. So I go down, get me a cup of coffee, and I sit there and I wait because I'm not going, this is going to be my system. I'm going to start from Mr. Aaron Abbott, you know, or whatever. Uh, and he shows up. He's an attorney. It's a big, nice law firm. And he waited, or no, I waited. And I came back with my coffee. He says, oh, he just got here. His office is back there. I walk back there with my little packet of references and, and stuff. And uh, he looked at me. He says, I said, man, I need some property. Uh, Long-term leases. Uh, and we're, we're going to probably need about 40 of them. That catches their attention. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, I, and, it's, and it's true. Paul Malloy would come in and say, we need about 2,000. Right. Well, nobody's going to believe you, you know. <laughs> but it's like over the next five years, we're going to need 40 of these houses. And these are long-term, life-term, lifelong leases, and here's our references. That catches their attention. And he said, well, I don't have any. I just do commercial, but here's a phone number. Zip, 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 zip. Call this guy. I said, thank you very much. Uh, I get in my car. I'm ready. I'm, I'm like... He didn't, write the phone, he didn't write the office down, so I had to break it. And I was like, I called to find out where the office was. He said, what kind of properties are you looking at? I've got a 80 of them. I said, I told him. It's like, what about this address? Meet me there in 20 minutes. We did a deal an hour later. Yeah. Yeah. So you only got 12 hours on me. But, 12 hours. It's still 12 hours. Yeah, it's still 12 hours. Right. But see, the key to going to, it's like, don't be lazy. Really, that's the bottom line. Don't be lazy. Go get some FaceTime. Don't do FaceTime on your phone. Let's do, do some real FaceTime, you know? Buy them lunch. Um, one of the most valuable tools I use is like, if they start getting bogged down with all these questions, and the, some of the questions are like, uh, uh, why can't one person be responsible for the lease? My answer to that is because that's a very weak system. And if that one person loses their job, um, all kinds of things that happen. So the entire house is responsible at any given time throughout the, uh, the, the length of this lease. That's a very strong system. It might take them a little bit to figure that out. It's like, what are you doing right now? Give me 20 minutes. Jump in the car. I'll buy you a Starbucks. Let's go look at these houses that were already in existence. Now, that's, that's a luxury that we do when we're already there. Um, the other one is, you know, we bring lifetime leases at four-year increments. If you're going to, we have a lot of people that buy houses for us, but I get in trouble Actually, I should get in trouble when I do four-year leases. But if you're going to buy a property for me, I, I guarantee you a four-year lease. That's a commitment on your part. You'll get a good commitment on our part. But that's a, a you know, it's going to be through the lifetime of the house. But we usually do it in four-year increments. Um, 
if it's a new area, you don't have a chapter, uh, but you can get uh, other landlords on the phone to talk to them. So here, let me let you talk to this investor that ha- owns 20 houses. Hang on a second. Boom, 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 boom. You know, let them know that you're going to be calling them. But, the, the, you know, previous landlords are your most valuable tool, too. And like Will was saying, man, I've, I've been at offices with the chapter checkbook in New Orleans ready to cut a check it's like we're wanting to do the deal it's like you know um and this lady was so stuck on well you know at the end she was trying to knickknack you know uh and at the end she you know ready to sign the lease she's ready to sign the lease and she's like well you know i charge rent from the day i say yes correct i'm like now this house is about five grand a month. That would have been about another thing. We're not able to move in for 10 days. You know, we need a 10 day window. And she was stuck on, she wanted that thousand dollars for that 10 days. Or whatever. I said, um, we don't pay for a house that we're not living in. Bottom line, we're not going to pay for a house. That we're not, we're not going to be able to move in until the 10th. Well, she says, well, then how about I just charge you a deposit? She, it's like, look, this $1,000 needs to be in our bank account, not yours. You know, we only, we get very limited funds. And she was trying to take half of it, you know, just like, and I'm thinking, I don't know if I want to do business with this lady. You know, um, if, if it's going to be like this, I mean, she owns a freaking Honda dealership. You know, she's got enough money. We don't. You know, we don't own a Honda dealership. We get four grand. You know, and it takes us two years to pay it back. And that thousand dollars, that's beds and dressers for a house. You know, and so they're going to be no, no. So I just said, I'm sorry, we couldn't come to a deal. And I closed the checkbook and I walked the hell out of there. You know what I mean? You might have to do that. And you, I know it's like it's exciting, but. We're interviewing our landlords too, right? And it's like, if they want to work with us, you know, I mean, we will treat them well. If they have a problem, they can call us and we will fix it. Um, we just like a little bit of, of give and take here. That's, so that really, that's what I got, man. I'll shut up. I think we're going to speak with Emily who found a house before I did. Thank you. <laughs> Hi guys. Hi. Can I shut this? Cause I'm really short. Um, so just so you all know, I'm super uncomfortable in what I'm wearing. Um, <laughs> like, you know, when I was actively using, uh, I would have worn this anywhere, and I would have been okay with it because I had no respect for myself at all. And uh, I thought that if you saw more of my skin or more of what I could offer you, that you would like me. And so today. I realize that that's not who I am because I like myself. And I think it's really important, especially for you ladies, to hear that because I would never walk up to a landlord dressed in booty shorts and a tank top. Um, (laughs) um, Someone told me a really long time ago that you should always dress for the job that you want and not for the job that you have. And I took that to heart. And so when I show up and I'm talking to people about renting their property, I am representing not only Oxford House, but I am representing the faces of people in recovery who can't speak for themselves yet. And if, if that person says no, I can still change their perception on what people in recovery look like. It is not always a no. Take a win when you can get one. So I just think that that's so important. Also, did y'all see I kept talking to Marty instead of Stacy? Yep. Also not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to lease a house from a couple, talk to both of them equally. Make eye contact. Ladies, don't touch the husband. Just don't touch him, okay? <laughs> it's fine, you know? But these are really important things. Um, I think also there are some other things I have listed on here that I wanted to go over besides don't talk to the boy, respect yourself. All right, so we've touched a lot on uh, looking at houses and going on Zillow, right? I heard uh, Marty say the magic number I use, which is 10, 10 a day. 
I make a list of 10 houses. I do drive-bys. I heard Stacy say she does drive-bys. I don't just do drive-bys at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I don't know about you guys, but there's not a lot of traffic at the Dope House at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, right? The traffic is like, you know, more around like 7 o'clock at night when everyone's gotten off work and they've got that money from that day job. So what I like to do is wait till a later time in the day and I do a second drive-by. And I make sure that what I saw during the day is what I see during the evening because that is a better, I'm so cold, that is a better understanding of what you have in that neighborhood. If there are people in Cadillacs on the corner and a light is on and a couple of people are sitting on the porch and you see cars stopping by and keeping it moving, you probably need to find another house, okay? Uh, If you see children playing on the street and it's about to be sundown, that's probably a better neighborhood. The truth is, is if families living in the neighborhood trust their children to play outside until the sun goes down, they probably are recognizing that this is a safe place to live. Um, When you are doing this, the reason I like that magical 10 number is because you're gonna hear no. I love to tell new staff to go out and do nothing but rentals for a minute because it is really, really great opportunity to learn how to be okay with the word no. Because that's what you're going to hear for a minute. I was very lucky when I found that house. I had no idea what I was doing. Let's just be honest. I just knew I wanted to lease a house. And um, we just happened to find someone that was willing to work with us who, uh, um, who gave us a shot. But that's not, that's not what usually happens. Usually we hear no. Um, practice your pitch. Every time you hear no, you're going to start to see a pattern in the questions they say no to. There may be something in your pitch that you could say differently to give them an idea of what what they really want to hear in a way that makes sense. Because sometimes it's just about how we say it. Another thing that you can practice while doing this 10 house a day pitch is for you to say no. I don't know about you guys, but I was not comfortable telling people no for a very, very long time. Maybe I'm too comfortable with it today, okay? If you ask some of the staff I work with, they'll probably tell you that I use no a lot. So will my kid. So, yeah. So get comfortable with it. Be okay with telling, telling anyone no. Landlords, here's the thing. The landlord may be the person you don't want to work with. The house could be perfect. It could be in a great location. It could be like the right size. It can be a wonderful home. But like recently we had an individual who just kept wanting to modify the lease to their specifications to the point that they even wanted to put in that they could make decisions for chapter guidelines for their house. I'm not, this is not a joke, okay? These are people that are probably going to be a problem. (laughs) Like, If you want to make the rules and guidelines for a democratically run house because you happen to be the landlord, this may not be a good long-term solution for us. Because I've made the mistake of wanting a house so bad that I leased a property that we probably shouldn't have leased. And then two years later, I had to move it. And let me tell you, moving a house is not fun. Has anyone in here had to move a property? Yeah, it's harder than opening one because the people that are in there are like, they they are at a point that they don't want to be there anymore because it's not a good, solid, stable housing. They don't want to help you. They want you to fix it. We've made a mistake and we've jumped into a property. So think about these things. Uh, Remember that we shouldn't do less than four bedrooms. We do want to have some people in a single. It, It does help a lot to have the promise that you could be in a room by yourself eventually. Um, <laughs> look, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a little side note in here. I was in a single room one time for one month. And Stacy Levin said, hey, I'm opening a new house. Do you know anyone who wants to open it? And I was like, nah, I got a single room. And she basically looked at me and was like, oh, people that are complacent don't grow, Emily. And I was like, damn it. <laughs> I actually moved that night. <laughs> And I moved back into a double room, and then I got a job with, uh, as an outreach worker, and I moved to Kentucky, and I, um, I had a double room. I lived in double rooms as a staff member with another person who was a resident. 
multiple times actually actually my roommate that is getting married in two months like we are really good friends I love the fact that I formed those bonds and relationships and I think it's important even if we're core members to show the newcomer that we're not unique we're not special we have not arrived okay we're still doing this thing right so all that being said here's a key key point I've moved seven times. I've lived in seven houses. I did that in 16 months. So that's about an average of three, ho- three months between houses. It, opening a house is not just about finding the house and saying, I've done it. Be willing to move into that house. Be willing to be the person that moves into that house who may have to sleep in a double room again and say, hey, guys, I'm just here to show you how to do this. I want to lead you to a new way of life. I want to give you an opportunity to learn this model and be a part of. And if you're not willing to do that, you might want to check yourself and find out why are you trying to rent this house? Is it about ego and prestige or is it about helping the next person? And once you do get to that point that everyone's talked about where you have an opportunity to get a lease on a table, talk to your outreach worker, talk to your chapter. This is a democratically run process. You don't go out, you don't find a lease, you don't sign a lease all by yourself. That's not what we do today. We want to make sure that the chapter likes the house that we've gotten, that the chapter's voting on it, that the outreach worker who may have had more experience is like, hey, yeah, that's a great area, or hey, I know this is a really good house, but that may not be the best area that you think it is. Um, And do all of that before you sign the lease. If you're a resident, if you're a staff member in the room, don't sign the lease. Because it's really, really important that we don't run on self-will. I don't know about you guys, but self-will got me into a lot of pickles. Um, Another thing is that that we want to look at is your house may be full. You may be at that 80% capacity that we want to see before we start opening another house. But if you're not actively involved with your chapter, if you aren't actively talking to the outreach worker, if you have an outreach worker, you may not realize that another house is empty. You may not realize that the entire area is in an 80% capacity. Before we open another house, we wanna make sure that we've stabilized the ones around us. Your service could be better used sometimes at being a housing services or a chapter chair and going and helping a house that isn't stable versus opening a new one if we don't need it because now we'll have two unstable houses. And then you have twice the work. So. I'm freezing, it is so cold in here, (laughs) but um, my name is Emily. If you have any questions, I answer my phone. If you feel like you want some more guidance on a house, call me, I'll talk to you. Thank you. So we've got um, 15 minutes, well, 12 minutes. Uh, If you have a question, we wanna go to the microphone there in the center aisle. And the panelists will answer those questions for you. The session's over at 9.30. Should be uh, on off on the bottom. Can you all hear me? There you go. I think I have like three questions. Are you all okay with that? The best one? Uh, all right. Well... So uh, I'm, in, I'm from San Antonio. I'm an alcoholic. My, my problem is Jason. Um, so it's been my experience that uh, outreach does a lot of opening houses. Um, I just I just wanted to hear from you guys and and whoever feels most equipped, I guess, or if all of you want to answer my question. Um, what uh, what do you think um, we can do to because because I know in the manual it says that. Um, once we get full, we start a waiting list, and then, and then as a house that's financially stable, we look to open a new house. But in my experience, I just haven't seen that happen. Um, and, I, and I think outreach does a really great job. But um, what can we do as, um, as more experienced members to encourage a house that has that, that type of money in a bank account to, um, to go out on that limb and, and, and look at opening a new house? Can you hear me? Okay. So when I came in, when I moved into Oxford House, there were 
there was one full-time outreach worker in Texas, in Houston, and one part-time in Dallas. So they never came to San Antonio. I think it was like a year before I met whoever was working for Oxford House at the time. And the Housing Services Committee would go and look at houses as a group and take it back to chapter. We would you know, get as many people together as we could to see it um, and then vote on it at chapter and, and do all of the paperwork ourselves, the, the chapter, the one chapter at the time, chapter eight, had a, um, had a housing services bank account that was used to give new houses loans so they could open. I mean, there, for a long time, there weren't outreach workers in all of these areas. There were, you know, a few states that had them, and yet expansion still happened. Um, it's, you know, we become outreach workers because we volunteered to, you know, be involved and open new houses. And um, so what I would suggest is that if you want to to go, you know, like if you want to take it back to the basics, like the how it's how it all happened in the very beginning, is make sure that there's a need. Um, get at least I would say three season members to move, and then just start looking and take it to the chapter. You know what yeah. I mean? Find the house, find the right landlord, take it to the chapter, get everybody on board and behind you because. If it required outreach workers for expansion to happen, none of us would be here because there was one house in Silver Spring, Maryland. I mean, houses opened in Washington because people did it. Houses opened in Texas because you know somebody opened a house in Texas and then it, and then people moved and opened more houses. So um, I would just, you know, it's it's not it's not that hard to just do it. All that all the information that we use is on the website. So, or, I mean, if you want to give me your email, I'll send you my packet. But I would just, you know, like start with, in San Antonio in particular, I had a lot of success in Craigslist. Mm. There are some places where like, you know, it's all just robots and, you know, whatever. But in San Antonio, I found a number of houses on Craigslist. So, you know, I would start there. And then like, I have a real quick one and it's kind of selfish, but um, I just moved houses. Uh, like our house moved, right? Uh, do I need to change the EIN? Like, do we? No. Because the address. Okay, cool. Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dave. I'm a person in long-term recovery, and for me, that means that I haven't used drugs or alcohol since 3:27 of 07. Um, <clears throat> I've been in Ox involved in Oxford House for about the last 10 years never as a resident, but um, I am a landlord. Okay. Um, so I've been, uh, um, so I have experience with Oxford houses and with kind of just running rough shot recovery houses. Um, my experience is that Oxford house is a way better model, works way better. Uh, the uh, neighbors, appreciate it much better I've had much more success and so now I'm you know leaning toward only doing Oxford House type um, so anyway so I'm, in my area I'm from New York um, we didn't have outreach we didn't have chapter when I first started Oxford House um, I had rented a house with a friend of mine which was bigger than we needed uh, in recovery and and we started taking on other addicts. And someone had uh, suggested to me that, hey, you should open an Oxford house. And I had no idea what that was and, or how to go about it and uh, kind of looked on the website and sort of figured it out. But at that time, we had really no outreach. We had no, um, no chapter, really, not a strong chapter anyway. Um, so. Uh, anyway, my point being is when, when I had first called and talked to somebody at Oxford House, I, I was really gung-ho about this, you know, and uh, I really saw the challenges of, uh, that women had in recovery, and, and I had spoke to a person on the phone at Oxford House and, and said, hey, you know, I want to open a woman's house too, and, you know, I was all ready to go with all this, and, and uh, you know, they kind of laughed at me on, on the phone, and, and so, uh, you know, I was a little taken back by that. Um, 
And I said, well, you know, why is that funny? And, and they suggested that, that it was uh, particularly challenging to do that. Um, it's still, in my mind, something that I would like to do, um, especially a woman with children's house. Um, and so can you kind of uh, elaborate on, on what the challenges may be to doing that and, and you know, where I can maybe get help with, with getting that going? Thanks. So I just want to say that I've opened more women's houses than men's houses. That we in Kentucky still have more women's houses than men's houses. And for the last three years, they keep telling me that's going to change. And I keep telling them to watch me not make it change. <laughs> But I'm gonna tell you why I think it's different. I think historically we've had a lot of male leaders and so we've opened a lot of male houses and the men have become stronger because they've watched other men grow and that we haven't had as many strong women leading an Oxford house. Um, you can see that exact same uh, ratio if you look in the recovery community. Um, and I think the difference that we can see in some areas is that we have strong female staff that are helping to produce strong female residents. Uh, and that's the truth. <clears throat> and yes, there, there are some special challenges because women oftentimes have custody of their children and they don't have the resources available to them. They don't have a significant other that's still actively participating in the child's life. They're trying to navigate how to live on their own, how to take care of a child, how to get daycare, how to... Um, get food on the table, how to work and do all of those things together. But there is a group of women here that are in one of the women and children's houses in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and those ladies have navigated it better than you could ever imagine. They've all lived together for two years. And I think one of the things that they've done that has led to the success of this home, which was the first women and children's home in the entire state, is they go to the grocery store together. They buy all their food together. They have dinner together with their children, and their children need at the table. And I think that it's really, really important to see that those are the steps that are being taken. Yeah, let's clap on that. That's really great. When we talk about a stigma associated with being women in recovery and opening women's houses, if we continue to talk about it and say that it can't be done, it won't be done. But if we just throw that stigma out, and I'm a huge fan of changing perceptions, and we just do it and allow the model to actually work, and we trust that process, I think we can open women's houses all over this country. Yeah. So, there's uh, one other thing I wanted to mention was uh, there is only one woman's house in, in our area, and uh, the, uh, the fellow that owns that house uh, says that it, it takes more time and effort to run that one house than it does all the other houses and that house has special rules special um you know um curfews and and uh, all type of things that are not the same as the men's house mm -hmm. um is, is that typical and that and it is typical because it is our responsibility to protect the children so there are additional rules, no overnight guests, um, definitely curfew. You know, safety of the children is the most important thing. And I will say in my experience that um, it does take a little bit longer for a woman's house to get stable um, because of the additional, you know, I mean, the additional challenges. But once it is, I mean, the strong, I mean, the areas that I've lived and worked in definitely have more women's houses than men's houses because I could always move into a woman's house to start it. Um, so, you know, and I moved, I think I lived in like 21 houses in five years maybe. So, um, but once it's up and running, I mean, it's amazing. You just have to be a little patient and, um, and know that there, you know, I would try to find some women, even if there isn't a, a women's Oxford house, I would try to find some strong women in recovery to support the house. Um, you know, go to AA NA meetings and have those women come over and, you know, have dinner with them once a week or something like that um, so that you're not a man trying to teach women how to be mothers, you know. <laughs> Try to engage the outside community. I've done that in places um, when I couldn't be there full time. Had some, you know, women with strong recovery and a lot of time come over and help out. 
Hey, we're going to do probably one more question. We've got like one minute left. We need to end on time. So those of you who don't get to ask your question, please come up and talk to the panelists. They'll be here for a few minutes afterward. Um, but we'll go ahead and take this last question. Yes, hi, my name is Doug. I'm an addict and alcoholic. Hey, um, so I really appreciate the, um, all the insight on opening a new house. Um, I'd like my, my question is geared more towards making the house a home. Um, we'll be opening a house on the 15th of this next month. Um, I believe it's going to be, um, we're in the Dallas area. We're part of a chapter of seven, six houses right now. So we're really fortunate as far as our support goes, but I'm just looking for, um, any, just looking out for any advice. So I got some, uh, three core members, uh, doing things together. I got the six to $800 Walmart run initially. Um, just, uh, while I have the opportunity to have you guys here, if there's any other advice I can get from y'all. I like to get beds in a bag. Like, you know, it's the comforter and sheets and pillows and all that. And I like to make all the beds. Okay. Um, so that when people move in, they have a made bed to move into and right. hang art on the walls, yeah. like art. make it a home, put up curtains and you know, like um, don't, I mean, make it the house that you want to live in and, and make it look like, you know, people are living there because right. the more of a home that it is, I mean, we're not institutions, we're homes. So, you know, try to make it as homey as possible, plant some flowers and, yeah. you know, so get some plants and, yeah, make the beds with, you know, with beds in a bag. They're not very expensive. You know, like you can get be beds in a bag for twin beds for like less than that, I think. Like usually 20. Go on Walmart sale, like, you know, in the sales section online. You can empty them out. And so that's a big thing for me is I, I like to make the beds. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. Right, I'd also, like to thank all quick, of our. Go ahead. If you, uh, if you will hang towels in the bathroom. Yes. Okay. It changes everything. It's, okay. It just does. Yeah. Thank you very much.